May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So we're on to week three of three, uh, looking at the Apostles' Creed. In our Lord Green Prayer Books, we're looking for page 171. Uh, and fortunately for us, in our prayer book, on page 170, we have the Nicene Creed as well. And I, I want to show you something in a second, but I'll read you the text. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the first thing I want you to notice is if you look at the sort of the third paragraph, if you will, of the Nicene Creed, you'll see it's much longer and it's more complex and convoluted. And that's partially because in the Nicene Creed, they are answering a set of quest a different set of questions, a more complex set of questions, which come out of, in a sense, this first, this last paragraph of the Apostles' Creed. So we've probably done the whole sermon series in the wrong order and the whole world is going to fall apart in chaos. Or not. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Um, and you can see that. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? In the Nicene Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. You can see they've had to do some fine-tuning of what they mean by, I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, uh, I can remember when I was uh, at St. Francis College, uh, we had to try and write our own creed. And myself, and I think it was Charlie and one other, we put a lot of time and effort into writing our creed. And we went and we showed it to our, um, uh, our senior lecturer, to, to the pr principal of the college at the time, uh, Don Edwards, uh, who's a brilliant theologian, and he goes, it's only got a few heresies in it, and hands it back to us. <sighs> and, and I honestly think he was, he thought that we had done pretty well, that only had a couple. Um, so, <laughs> it's, it's always tricky working your way through the creeds. Uh, so, the first thing obviously is that it, it is a Trinitarian statement. It's, it's a statement about our picture of God as three and of one. And so we've, we've affirmed our, ex, our belief in the existence of God as Father, as Son, and now as Holy Spirit. And although every experience of God is an experience of, of the Trinity, for me, I find it the easiest to think of it this way, is in that the Holy Spirit is the mechanism by which God continues to act with us, interact with us as individuals and the church. And the Holy Catholic Church. And you'll notice that both the Spirit and the Church are described as holy. Holy means set apart, set aside, taken out and you for a different context. And when we talk about a spirit, uh, now, some people think spirits are spooky, woofy kind of stuff. Um, but have you heard the German word Zeitgust? The, the spirit of the day, the kind of the movement of the day, if you will. Uh, and things have an energy, a spirit about them, which has nothing to do with sort of uh, necessarily to do with all sort of spookiness. It's to do with kind of a way of thinking about things and a way of interacting with things. And our communities do that. And so here we have the Spirit of God that is separate from, if you will, our way, our normal way of interacting with the world around us. And the church is supposed to be the same. It's not supposed to be a structure like other structures. I always... I find it difficult. I have to acknowledge that the church is a structure in society. Of course it is. Of course it is. Anyone who thinks it isn't hasn't stopped and just had a momentary objective look at the church. Of course it's a structure in society. But in a sense, it should always be struggling against that. It should always be struggling against the, the calcification, if you will, to be a, 
uh, a structure in society because it's supposed to be called out of that to be very much a different place. And what it is, is it shouldn't be the structure, the building, and all the rest of it. Um, do you remember the, the song, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the people. Do you remember that one? Yeah. I've fallen asleep in a number of sermons. Um, <laughs> so the church is the communion of saints, the coming into one union of all the saints. Now, it's super handy to be able to do it in a building because, you know, it keeps the rain off your head. Uh, it stops the cold wind from blowing through. It gives you a place to store the books, all those sorts of things. But the building, although we often use, use the word church for them, isn't the church, certainly not in the context of the creed. In fact, when the creeds were written, they hadn't got around to doing the building stuff, per se. Um, so it's the communion of saints. For me, this is actually quite a really, this is a really important part. Because it's not just, you know, the couple of us who gather together in this building. It's not even all those who gather together to worship uh, at the moment. It's, it is the great stream of all those who seek God throughout time and space. And the thing that marks us is our engagement with God and the forgiveness of sins. Now, uh, many people try and engage with God, and, and that's a really good thing and is to be encouraged. But when we talk about the forgiveness of sins, it is not primarily this notion that we've done naughty things and God has cleared the slate of those naughty things. It's actually, well, it, it, on a deeper sense, it's that God summons us to live a life where, despite our sinfulness, we are constantly uh, working to be less sinful, less damaging, less harmful, less distancing of ourselves and God. And so the forgiveness of sins is the removal, if you will, of the power of that to separate us from each other and from God. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. The resurrection of the body here is most frequently understood to refer to the resurrection of Christ. Uh, so, you've got to remember, once again, the historical context of this matters. Um, and even in the Gospels, we see signs that after Christ had been raised, there were people who were going around going, oh, his disciples just stole and hid his body. Uh, we can see that in the Gospels, that people were saying that already. And so, this is an affirmation that in this experience, in the resurrection, we experience something real. But I suspect that in this day and age, there is a very different message that we can uh, let impact on us. And it's this. It's that God loves us. And that includes our bodily existence. So often in the world, we hear this message that either all we are is body, or you have a spirit and you have a body, and the body is evil, and the spirit is good. You, you, you possibly heard that kind of picture out there. Um, it's, 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 it's the same thinking, if you will, that says, you know, uh, for, you know, sex is bad or any of those sorts of things because it's, it's, it's bodily. Um, and the idea is, you know, God is all about spirit and the body is all about the dirtiness and the muck. But what do you do when the creed says, no, 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 God resurrects, returns to life 
this thing that the rest of the world tells you is basically death. Well, what you then can't do is turn around and ignore the living experience of other people. You can't afford to turn your backs on other people whose day-to-day -day experience is pain and suffering because God says that should be about life. And for them, it's about pain and death. And so there's a great challenge in there for us as to how we live our lives. And the last line then, and the life everlasting. There's this idea that quite often what drives people is uh, a fear of death. And you, you may have heard people say this, you know, when you've got a tombstone, you know, when you die and on your tombstone there will be the date of your, your birth and the date of your death and there's a little dash and what's going to fit in that dash? You've heard that? You've heard that analogy, that story? And for a lot of people it's, you know, build a business, be successful, go on trips, do stuff because you're going to die. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die or something like that. So the question becomes, well, what if you weren't going to? How would you live your life then? It would be marked by very different things. It wouldn't be marked by a fear of what's coming. It wouldn't be marked by darkness and fear or arrogance and drive. It would perhaps be marked by things that are far more eternal. It would be marked by the presence of God, by an abundant overflowing of love, by, by these things that are eternal. It would be marked by compassion, because if you thought there would never be a time when you die, and you saw someone in pain, you're not giving up these short-term resources you have to be with to help them, but rather you're going, I've got all the time. And so Life everlasting, for me, is about a life that's not driven by this fear of death, but is rather empowered by the presence of love, which is eternal. So when we affirm the faith of the church, and we'll use the Apostles' Creed today shortly, let us affirm our connection to all those who seek to be responding to God by continuing to work through our brokenness, our sinfulness, and to be proclaimers of life and eternity. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.